before we had this data. Okay, does it line up pretty close with what happened? Yeah, okay, freakishly close, okay, uncanny, okay. Peter Sullivan said, no, we'll ever do that again and never come out that good. He actually didn't say that, but, but you know, but I mean, that's uncanny, right? You got nine out of 10 in the right order in the stacking, okay? So first of all, the trait's pretty heritable, okay? Second thing is we fed those bulls on a roughage ration and we fed those steers on a 68 megacal high concentrate ration. Did it matter? Or did the roughage predict the concentrate? Predicted it, right? So that's pretty interesting. The next thing you can observe on there is that from the top to the bottom, there's a huge difference. If that conversion held true for the entire time that those steers were on feed, there's a $164 difference between the sire's progeny at the bottom and the sire at the top on feed conversion. Just on feed conversion, okay? That's a lot of money, folks, okay? It's a lot of money. Big difference, big value difference. The sire at the top is one of the most heavily used bulls in the Angus breed right now, okay? Is that a mistake? What are his daughters doing? I got this data. The guy who has the herd called me. He said, Lee, he said, these are my cleanup bulls up here. They all got beat by your AI bulls. I said, yep. He said, that's bad. I said, yep. He said, are you sure that data's right? I said, well, did you tag the calves right? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, you were at the feedlot the day they weighed them. Did they cheat? He said, of course they didn't cheat. I said, you think they measured the feed in the bunk? He said, yeah. I said, you think that data's right? He said, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and he's one of these kind of guys like most of you and me. He stews on it, right? You stew on it. So about two weeks go by, and I get a call at 9 o'clock at night. And he said, I just said, do you think my cows eat as much as out of those of the feed conversions as bad as it was on those steers? You think that I'm creating cows that eat too much and then I'm, I figured out how much it cost me. I, I sent all those bulls to slaughter. <laughs> and he did. Okay? They're not there anymore. Okay? And I mean, you're on 1,200 cows, that's a lot of bulls. Okay? But, but these differences are big, and I do think it carries over to the cow herd. And the magnitude, now start thinking. Let's go back to the way I started the conversation. Think about the accumulated cost of having cows on your operation over the next, think of it in terms of a generation, right? You're going to turn over generational ownership every 20-so years on your operation, maybe a little longer. What's the cumulative cost of having cows out of the bull at the top versus having cows out of the bull at the bottom? Okay, big, big differences here, okay? Big differences on the number of cows you can run on your 100 acres, okay? Big differences to think about. Now, we, we've tried to document that this stuff works in other ways. Bio identified this bull protege. He's a bull we bought down at the sale in Gardeners in Kansas. They said, this bull's pretty efficient. Well, we bought him in partnership with ABS. See, we, we're still friends, even though they didn't buy that other bull with me. Um, and so we identified him as being a good feed conversion bull, and we, we said, uh, ABS, why don't you go ahead and progeny test them? And they have a progeny test deal where they test all their AI sires, and then they measure those calves from birth to slaughter. And during that a period of that, they put them in a feedlot, and they feed them individually. And lo and behold, when they measured him, they said he's in the top 1% on gain, and he's in the lowest 30% on intake. Is that beating the antagonisms? You bet it is. So they ate less than 70% of the bloodlines they've evaluated, and they gained more than 99% of them, okay? Now, you don't have to be a geneticist. You don't have to be an economist. You don't have to be an accountant to figure out that if they eat less and they gain more, they're going to make more money, okay? That's pretty straightforward. Number two feed conversion bull out of 300 sires they've ever evaluated. Number one bull they've ever evaluated from birth to slaughter on profitability, okay? The EBVs work. You can find these antagonistic animals, and when you do, you can bet that that data is going to extrapolate. I mean, that was done in Missouri on a different ration than what we use in Colorado, and the same thing happened. Okay, what about crossbreeding? Brian said, you're not going to talk about crossbreeding. you got to talk about crossbreeding. You're known for being crossbreeders. So 
Okay, crossbreeding is important. Um, it, it's another of these factors that we want to look at. You know, do we trace cha chase traits within breeds or do we utilize differences between breeds? Do we take advantage of this 23% more pounds weaned per cow exposed? Go back to profit per acre. If you have two herds of cows and one's producing 23% more pounds weaned per cow exposed, do you think it's going to be more profitable per acre? A lot more. Okay. A lot more. But why don't we all do it? Well, there's problems with crossbreeding. First of all, as the uniformity goes out the door, and we really would like to be uniform in our production, although I've driven around Ontario for a couple of days, and there's some herds that aren't that uniform, I have to say. I'm sure they're none of you guys, but you know. But, uh, but so it's hard to keep uniformity, and, and, and Angus is a pretty dominant breed, whether it's red or black. You know, if we were going to pick one breed to breed as purebreds, we'd probably breed Angus. The market likes Angus. Angus is known in the, in the meat market as, as one of the preferred uh, types of beef, and so it's a dominant breed. So the solution that we came up with is we said we're going to breed this synthetic breed, this composite that's a mix of breeds, and we're going to make them look like Angus cattle and be uniform. All the animals pictured on that slide are composites, okay? And then we're going we're to select them and, and have EDVs on them and try to make them competitive with Angus. Because you see, think of it this way. You all have sports teams up there. I guess you guys like to play hockey, right? Yeah, hockey, okay. So if you come from a town with 300 people and you take your all-star, you know, 10 and 11 year old hockey team, right? And you go and play against the all-star team from Toronto, who wins? Toronto wins, right? Because they got a way bigger pool to pick from, right? They got a bigger pool to pick from. Well, in Angus, think about Angus is the biggest population today, breed-wise. So they got this big pool to pick from. So if I'm going to crossbreed with something that's not all Angus, then I got to make sure that it still hunts in the comparison with the Angus cattle, right? So we got to compete on that. The reason that, that we like the stabilizers, it's, it's a very purposeful blend of the British and the Continental. The Continental cattle, of course, have the muscle. The British breeds have the marbling. We want that blend. The British breeds tend to have easy fleshing. The continental breeds, if they're dual purpose in origin, with the Gelby and Simmental are, they have the milk production. So again, we're, we're combining antagonisms here. We know that from the research that was done um, at the USDA center, that this, this combination is actually as easy fleshing as an F1 Herford Angus. The F1 Herford Angus was really the dominant cow in the high plains of the United States for decades. And so people, like that degree of, of fleshing ability. We know that by putting this composite together properly, we keep a blend and then we keep the hybrid bigger and we actually measure that and we still get uniformity. I could, I could do the whole talk on explaining why all that happens, but it, it's, again, it's like the electronic trans, transmission. You just have to trust us on that. Our database now is up over about 400,000 animals, okay? So we can calculate EBVs on these animals that are just as predictable as Angus are. Um, they're used worldwide now, and, and we're gathering that data back and analyzing it. We've marketed over 10,000 of these bulls, and we have like 700 of them on test this year. They'll start our sale, okay? And our, and our big commercial customers are all going that way because they like to crossbreed, and they can use this synthetic breed and crossbreed and have the simplicity of single breed mating, but keep their hybrid bigger. Not all of it, but 60, 70. 75, somewhere in there, percent of the F1 hybrid bigger. So it's a nice alternative, and it's one that's increasingly being used in our country. And then we go out within these breeds, and we use all-stars. I mean, here's a cow that's the number three cow in the Simmental breed based on an index they have that predicts profitability, okay? And we flush that cow to the highest bulls in the Angus breed, and we produce hybrids from that, and we stick them in our composite. Okay, we do the same thing with all the breeds we use. We're currently focusing very heavily on red and black Angus, Gelby, Simmental, and we, we need a fourth breed in there. We, we worked with Hereford for a little while, you know, had some color problems and some other limitations. We're, we're focused right now on South Devon as being the fourth breed in that mix. That's hard. We went to a small town, right? It's not a big population, not very many cattle to choose from. But the data we have despite the fact that it's a very small population, there are a, a disproportionate amount of animals that rank high in our system, and we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. 